I'm the only private gym in the county where I live. I don't even have my sign up on the building anymore. I have a big sign on the door that says, do not enter. <laughs> Warning. Call for an appointment. I'm not kidding. That, that's what an I interesting way to run a business, by the way. You're no. like, don't come in here. Don't come in here. No. That's I got a right. keypad on the door. You're not welcome. Hey guys, welcome to part two of my discussion with Mike the Machine Bruce, incredible strong man. This is uh, really getting into his training routine, training philosophy. We're going to talk about dealing with injuries and other stuff. Anyway, make sure to check him out on social media. I'll link his Instagram page, his YouTube page, and check out this incredible device on how you could build your neck. He uh, collaborated with NeckFlex to develop this. I'll link all that information in the description below. And make sure to help please support the channel by hitting the like button, subscribing, and sharing the video. And with that said, let's get on to this discussion. Hey, go, going oh, no. to back to when you started lifting, though, at 13. So did you just do, like, the normal bodybuilding or powerlifting lifts, you know, like your bench press, your, your squats, your deadlifts, your curls? Like, did you just do that, or did you get into more, like, the weird lifts? Because you do a lot of weird stuff on Instagram, and you do those weird you know, bending horseshoe, like nobody does that, man. Like I've never met a guy who bends horseshoes or does the things well, that, now. <laughs> well, yeah, aside from now, like that's just yeah. not something you see. So did you have like a normal, like lifting routine or did you just start getting yeah. that weird stuff early on? Well, unfortunately I did. I had, um, it's like everybody, I don't even, I'm not a fan of this guy at all anymore, but I had the Arnold Schwarzenegger Psychopedia of Bodybuilding. That's a great book. And I could care less about Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'll be back. But uh, I, as a wrestler, I started doing high volume push-ups, and I would run, and I would do abs. And that's what I did. And then I didn't have access to weights right away. So, of course, again, I'm 47. So my mom um, and the boogeyman at the time bought me the, the weights with sand in them. Yeah, I had those too. So I was popping uh, routines out of – first I was doing the push-ups all the time and the abs and the running and pull-ups for wrestling. And then I started trying to do routines out of his encyclopedia book and that Schwarzenegger book. And then um, as, I got, as I got older, like yourself, you know, the only thing you really had access to when I was in high school or, or seventh grade, eighth grade was a bodybuilding magazine. So I would buy, I'd save my money. I, I worked since I was 13 years old. I used to haul junk and things of that nature and, and uh, make money. And so I would buy like Flex and uh, Muscle Mag International was one of my favorites. And I would try to copy those. And then later on in life is when the strength feats started coming into play. Was so it because like, routine, sorry, you, you met somebody, right? I think you referenced a name earlier that kind of got you into that strength yes. world. Yes. Well, okay. there was three people. The first one was Jed Johnson through the diesel crew. And if you don't know who that is, Jed's a great grip guy, really great at bending. He, he was um, bidding a spike on a video, and I thought I could do that. And I knew him from correspondence through email back in the early 2000s. So I went to the Home Depot and got a spike and tried to bend it and almost broke blood vessels in my head. Couldn't bend it. And then after him, uh, I met Bud Jeffries, who's a famous performing strongman. He's got a very large presence on Instagram. Dear friend of mine. He was my mentor, got me started. And then after him, Dennis Rogers was probably the most famous performing strongman probably in the history besides the Mighty Adam. He took me under his wing via Bud and just uh, kind of polished me up a little bit. And it, it is a different strength. There's techniques to it, but it, you got to practice a lot. High volume, you got to bend a lot of easier pieces and build up, just like, you know, weightlifting. Yeah, that makes sense, man. Um, just getting that world is kind of fascinating, but uh, like, I guess it was an addiction for you in some ways, it sounds like. Well, training is an addiction to me. Sometimes it's hard to turn a switch off. I, you asked me before we went on camera of, um, did I work out today? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I worked out today. <laughs> and I wasn't being a smart aleck, of course, but I, I try to take one day off, but I just love training so much. And the way that I train enables me, I train my way. I don't train other people's way. I don't follow other people's ways. I, I know what works for me. And I, as I said earlier, I still train as if I was going to compete on the mat, but I train more as to be able to be functional and tactical. Lord forbid if some crazy Yahoo tried to, break into my gym and my business, or if I'm out with my wife or what have you, or out with my gym crew after class, we go to breakfast. And I had to do something to protect somebody. I want us to be able to do that. Oh yeah, of course. Absolutely, man. Uh, out of curiosity, like what is your routine right now? Like what do you, so if you're, if you're going six days a week, like 
do you have like a split or like, how's your routine look like? <laughs> so my routine, so I've got to mention somebody's name because this gentleman and I train the, pretty much the same way. We met each other. I've never met him in person, just like I met you in person, but this guy's out of New Jersey. His name's Anthony Argeros. He's a hundred time champion in grappling. Wow. 100, 100 championships. Dude, I've not been on the mat with him. I'd love to because I think it'd be great. But anyway, the way that I train is a lot like how he trained because you got to, you always got to be, I got to tell you this, David, since you started this, these channel is that you always got to make sure you put pieces in play because you have some knucklehead to people want to run their mouth and say, well, so-and-so said this, and this right? So that's why I'm mentioning um, Anthony Argeros. What I do for a workout, I do 500 push-ups six days a week. I do 500 push-ups. Real, real quick, Mike, pounds. not to cut you off. How this? How how are this? How is it broken down? Are you doing sets of fifty? Are you I'm, doing sets? I'm gonna tell you. I, I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. So I write I write one through twenty on a piece in my journal. One through twenty. Do twenty five push-ups. The second exercise is conditioning. So it could be sprawls, air dive bike, or jump rope. You do that for thirty seconds. Then you get up on the pull-up bar and you do. Right now I'm doing sets of eight. You do eight pull-ups. So you do that. The pull-ups is ten rounds. So I'm doing eight, 80 reps, right? Mm -hmm. You only take 15 second break after those three exercises. Enough time to write down, to mark off what you did so you'll get freaking confused. After I hit the 10th round, I get to round 11, the push-ups stay the same. I'm always switching my hands around, so I'll turn my hands in. Push-ups are always the same. Middle exercise I'm putting here, because that's where I do my conditioning. So, um, middle exercise is the same. It's you know sprawls, mountain climbers, jumping jacks, air dive bike, which is over there. So on and so forth. But the pull-ups become isometric negative hold. So I'll get up there. Some, I'll do overhand chin up, uh, pull-ups. I'll do underhand uh, chin-ups. Either way, you get up there. I hold for eight seconds, and I lower down slowly. Mm -hmm. I try to get that knocked out between 35 and 45 minutes. After that, I then lift. So what that oh, means Oh, that's is, the warm-up. That, that would kill most people, but that's your warm-up. Okay. Well, I always open with calisthenics. So what that's enabled me to do is I've got a lot of wear and tear in my body. I don't get lift anymore. And that mentality is how I trained when I was a kid for wrestling. And then even in submission wrestling, in my, my, my competitive years were when I got out of the Marine Corps, it was, I, was, I was 22 to 25, 26. That's how long I competed in grappling, all that kind of stuff. And so I trained similar. And I always remembered that a lot of people wouldn't do that kind of training because they don't want to do push-ups and push -ups. Some people say it's overkill. But here's why I do it. My mentality is this. Again, I train so I don't get tired. Even though I'm not on the mat with you, per se, right? I want to go if I am on a mat. Why am I holding and doing a negative and squeeze? Because my idea is if I get a human across face and I submission hold you, my arms aren't going to blow up and get tired. Any grappler knows after a while you keep scrapping, your form and your grip blows up. My grip's not going to blow up because I do high volume bending and steel. So I hold that position. So when I get a submission hold, hopefully it hurts more. My arms don't get tired. I don't get blown up. So after I do that, I then my reward is to lift. Why do I want to do that? Again, I don't want to be injured. I want to longevity, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm already going to be gassed, which means I'm not going to be able to handle as much weight as I typically would. And I do it for time. So I put the Tabata timer on there. And 20 seconds, I might do chest press, rest 10 seconds. 20 seconds, work, 10 second rest. Or I might do a super set of like chest press and maybe pullovers. So I got a pullover machine in that direction, an old school pullover machine. So I might do 20 presses, 20 pullovers. 15 presses, 15 pullovers. 10 presses, 10 pullovers. Five, five, rest a minute, do it again. That's 100 reps. No matter what lifting I do, I try to make it total 100 reps. And I try to have it done in an hour. So that my whole workout lasts probably. 50, 55 minutes. Okay, so basically... It's a lot of unpack. <laughs> yeah, so basically you start off exhausting yourself, you know, with, with your push-ups, your, your ab work, your, your, um, your, your negative um, chin-ups, your pull-ups. Mm -hmm. yes, you sir. exhaust yourself. You go to your lifting. Let's say you're doing... Let's say it's Monday and you're yes, doing sir. chest, right? You don't do chest, back, and legs on Monday, do you? No, yes. no, no, no. Okay, so you're not because some people will do their whole body like every day, which, which is weird, <laughs> you know. But no. it works for some people. I'll pick, I'll pick an exercise or two 
because I don't do a lot of arm stuff. I've never been in big into doing biceps and all that kind of stuff. I most of my what size I do have is from again, I don't care about size, it's from doing pull-ups, chin-ups, and heavy rows. Sure. So let's say like um, like today, for example, was 500 push-ups, conditioning. Sometimes on the conditioning, the second exercise might be abs, might be reverse crunches, cross ups, weighted crunches. Okay. And I did pull ups. So my exercise at the end, what I did was I did shrugs and I did banded. I used the banded to shoulder press. So I did 20 dumbbell shrugs, 20 pressing, 15, 15, 10, 10, 5, 5, rest 60 seconds, do it again. Yeah, it, it's an interesting routine, man. Basically, you kind of train in some ways like a fighter and you train to be tough and obviously strong. You don't sound like you train for aesthetics, even though obviously there's no. going to be crossover. Just like if a dude trained for aesthetics, he's going to be strong. Uh, nowhere near your level, but he's going to get stronger. So I guess for you, aesthetics is just like a byproduct of your of your workout routine, but not why you're doing it. Like I never cared about like that. I never cared about that. Well, let me ask you this. How often do you really test yourself? I mean, going heavy. I know you say you exhaust your body, but like I've seen some of your recent Instagram posts where you're doing, which this is absolutely ridiculous for anyone who lifts. You're, you're literally doing 315 on the bar, like rows. Like that doesn't even make sense to me. And I'm like, I consider myself somewhat strong. But when I see a guy, even if you weigh 400 freaking pounds doing 315 with one arm, like... <laughs> That doesn't even make sense to me, man. Because when I see Arnold Schwarzenegger doing 315 barbell rows with two arms, that's impressive. And he's huge. And it's with two arms, but you're doing that with one arm. Like, that doesn't even make sense to me, man. But but where I'm going with this is, how often do you, like, really test yourself? Because I'm assuming that's got to be kind of heavy for you, right? <laughs> well, that, that video was also from years back. I don't train like that anymore. That's when I was testing, when I was deadlifting regularly. Okay. That one arm row with a with the barbell 315 like this. Um, I, I always do my neck. I do my neck right now, currently three days a week. But as far as pushing myself, um, it would be on a Saturday, like you and I are talking today on a Saturday. So if I wanted to push and really try something, it would be today. Um, but really I don't have any strength goals at the moment. My, my goal is always to get my time on my opening calisthenic down lower, if I get it down faster. And then I, I keep track of what weights I use when it comes to the lifting. So my goal is to always improve, maybe not every workout. My, I have a formula where some people might not like this, but again, like I said earlier, and I might sound a little abrasive, I don't care because <laughs> I train my way. You understand? Yeah, sure. So I do 10 days straight, for example. So if I did, so I did shoulder press with the band today and I did shrug. So the next time I do that, I might do the same weight for, you know, so it's 10 consecutive days. The reason why is I figure even though I use the band, if I'm using the weights when I'm shrugging, if I do that 10 days consecu consecutively, I've owned that weight. That weight is now mine, mm -hmm. right? Because I tend to, I mean, it's time to go up, obviously. So yeah. I go up to his big brother because, you know, the, my dumbbells are over that direction. So, you know, you got little brother, big brother, bigger brother, you know, cousins, you know, so on and so forth. So there's always somebody else in the neighborhood that wants to come down and, you know, show you how strong they are in the neighborhood, yeah. the dumbbell world. Also. So that's kind of what I do 10 days straight, then I increase. That also enables me to not get injured and not jump the gun too fast. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Patience. You got to rush and do the work, but don't rush to reach the destination. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a life. You got to enjoy the journey. It's a lifelong process. I mean, like you said, you've been doing it 35 years. I've been doing it 27, you know. Um, and then you got like these, what you would call knuckleheads who haven't even lifted, who immediately want to jump on gear. Like, uh, for example, yeah. my wife's tattoo artist doesn't even lift buy steroids and it's going to start lifting it's just like that is the biggest idiot on the planet like learn what to actually do eat right get your results and then think about it maybe five years later right but anyway this knucklehead wants to do it right out the gate and doesn't even know how to bench press it's like that those kind of people really piss me off you know well i always say i've, I've been saying stuff for years I, you know i i'm not big on the social media thing i i, I you're you you kind of see my channel on Instagram or you, well, I'm pretty unfiltered. I just want to be left alone, not bother anybody. You know what I mean? Right. You just do your thing, do you. But um, with what you said about knuckleheads doing things, it's kind of like I've, I've been saying for years, master the basics, build your foundation. The basics lead to mastery. Mm -hmm. And the fun is in building the body. When you get to be my age and or your age, 
that's where the hard part, that's where the, the real hard charges, you understand, come into play because to maintain what you have, it's easy to obtain, but to maintain, and then when people actually think you're on stuff, it's difficult to do. You know, it's hard because things do slow down in your body. Sure. And I, I like supplements, of course. You know, I've just never taken anything illegal. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I said that. I've taken, I've tried things like back in the day, back when, you know, before the FDA and the crooked government decided to take things away from us, you know, I've tried supplements. Okay. Yeah. But you probably so, still on like things like creatine or glutamine and I would. I take glutamine. I, I don't take creatine. I, I don't want to be muscle bound and tight. You know, I, I take glutamine. I take a, I take a lot of supplements more geared towards health, like cholesterol. I don't have a cholesterol issue, but I just don't like doctors. I don't outsource my care. So I only go to the VA when I absolutely have. To. Okay. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, the way I look at it, uh, you know, healthy lifestyle, healthy eating, most of my supplements basically are for health benefits or recovery. Yes, and exactly. essentially the way I look at it, if you're healthy, you're going to get good results in the gym if you're healthy internally. So my whole goal is to basically never have to go to like pharmacists because people will load up on, oh, this is for your cholesterol. This is for your insulin. This is for this. This is for that. I'm all like, I never want to take any of these. I mean, maybe I'll have to someday, but my whole goal is to try to... um you know, not ever have to get on any of that stuff. Some people are taking like 20 pills a day, you know, just to fix one thing and it breaks another thing. And then they got to take another thing to fix that. And you know, now, some people real quick, Mike, do have genetic issues. Like they may naturally have high cholesterol, even if they work sure. out and eat healthy. And then in that case, sure, take what you have to take. But I yeah. think the vast majority of people just do diet and training can basically get to the point where they never have to take any of those medications. I agree with you. If you just take care of yourself, unless you're pre pre compromised, of course. Yeah. Hey, so you basically train a bunch of clients uh, as a personal trainer. Do you give them like your routine, or do you like what? What if somebody says, "Well, I just want to look really good"? Would you train that person, or would you just be like, "No, I really only train guys that want to kind of do what I do and just be strong and whatever." No, I wouldn't train them, and I don't do uh, no. I'm the only private gym in the county where I live. I don't even have my sign up on the building anymore. I have a big sign on the door that says, do not enter. <laughs> Warning. Call for an appointment. I'm not kidding. That, that's what an I interesting way to run a business, by the way. <laughs> You're no. like, don't come in here. Don't come in here. No. That's I got a great. keypad on the door. You're not welcome. What about the whole Christmas spirit thing? Any flexibility there? <laughs> nah. <laughs> Here's the deal. I'm starting my 14th year in business. I don't like the government, but I pay my taxes. They're going to keep them off your ass. Sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to cuss. So I run a private gym. I don't do personal training. I don't care when people call me and say, oh, I'm a fighter. I do that there at UFC. I don't care. I'm not impressed. I'm not scared. I could care less. So my gym, I don't train them with my programs. I have a co-ed gym. I train men and women in a co-ed environment. And basically what I do is teach them cardio, kickboxing, strength training, and conditioning. Most of my programming is based off of my background because I am not a freaking fake and try to pretend to be something I'm not. I've never ran around my banana head and flexing doing fitness shows and bodybuilding. Sorry, there was a stupid bug in my way. I, so I'm not going to teach that. I teach what I know. So basically, I focus on weight loss, getting stronger, and getting those people to understand that the person looking them in the mirror, they need to love that person first. If they don't love them, they're not going to love themselves. They ain't going to love anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I help people drop weight. I've got a special vibe in there, a unique camaraderie that I've always wanted to have, and things are very, very good. And so that's what I do. And I also teach them combatives on the side. We do combatives at least twice a week, more so geared my version of self-defense to the point of I want them to learn to become a predator and not a prey. And when there is a problem, you freaking go forward and you smash and smash every time harder until the threat is neutralized and then you take off and run. That's, That's basically Krav Maga, man. It, it's the same principle. You know, they always talk about the Nike defense. You don't know if someone's got a weapon, you know, if they got other group of people with them. You want to get out of there, but you know, it's really just that zero to hundred mindset, smash, smash, smash harder, get the F out of there. Why yes. wait around for the cops if you don't have to? Because even if you're the good guy, you could still get in a lot of trouble, man. Oh yeah. And, 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 and again, I always stress, you know, we don't want any problems. You just want to go bust your way. Here's the thing. I tell them this and I'll say it to you and your viewers. 
difference. No, I am me, you are you. You got to focus on building you, build you, build yourself, self-improvement, and take care of self, then take care of others. The thing is this, just leave people alone. That's my whole thing I tell my people. I'm like, people are the way they are. You're not going to change them, but you don't have to join them. Like, I don't argue. I won't argue. Any girl I did in the past or, or my wife, I don't argue. It's beneath me. Number one, I'm not good at it. Number two, I'm not going to debate with you. And number three, you're not going to change my mind. I'm not going to change your mind. So therefore, let things simmer down. And just go come to a, a, a happy medium regarding your, you know, your significant other or whatever, whatever it be. But as far as someone out in public, I don't care if they want to grow three heads. I don't care what they want to call themselves an animal. I could care less. Do, do your thing. Just leave me alone. And I'll leave you alone. Nope. Yeah, Life I always, I always just tell people uh, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll just have to uh, respectfully agree to disagree and, exactly. and go from there. That's just a better way, you know, to go about. Things. Hey, life is too short. I just want to be happy and live life and for the new, small nucleus of people I care about. Just be happy and just do this thing called life. As far as I know, we only can do it once, right? Mm-hmm. And like I said, Father Time's coming for us all. So if I can do my best to keep him at bay as best I can, then hey, I'm, I'm doing good. Yeah. Hey, let, let me ask you this, Mike. Everybody who's been lifting for any period of time obviously will run into injuries, sometimes really serious ones. Now, I know you had a pretty bad back injury like in 2015. Like, can you, like, how, how did that happen anyway, if you don't mind sharing? So I had two major injuries. I hurt my lower back in the Marine Corps in 1994. And that's what ended up, it, it, it was the, that was like the pre- Part that led to what happened in 2015. So, and two uh, before I get to 2015, so I jacked it back up, and in 2000, 2005, I tore this left pec. So this left pec, I don't know if you guys can see that on camera, but it's here. My tendon's right there. It's supposed to be up here. So the VA, I go to the VA hospital. They just diagnosed me in this idiot army surgeon. I know I'm kind of talking nasty, but he said I tore my bicep, and I was like, "What are you, a flipping idiot? I didn't tear my bicep, dummy." I was bench pressing. I tore my freaking pec. So anyway. I did that once really in high school, by the way. I tore this one, the right side. <laughs> did you have surgery? No, but I was I was 15 at the time. I, w- I, I, I didn't remember everything, dude. I was benching 235, and I had my dad spotting me. This was at the Army gym, by the way. It, it was like the fifth rep. It's just like a giant rubber band snapping. I was like, yes. oh, fuck. You know? Yes. Anyway, my dad picked the weight up. And I'm like the guy that doesn't go to the hospital. Like if I got shot, I might go. But other than that, like I will never go. I will fight it to my death before I go. My wife will force me to go sometimes. But long story short, I couldn't do anything for like nine months as far as like benching. I I would still lift my legs, lift my back. There was one machine that I could do as like an incline fly machine just so I could get blood in there, even though it was excruciating. So even being that young and able to bounce back because I was 15, I would sideline for like nine months doing what I can. And I would say in my early twenties, it kind of got to the point where I didn't really feel it anymore. So I didn't have to get surgery, but it probably took six years to basically heal itself. But anyway, what, what happened to uh, yours? Well, I, the same thing. So I rubber band. I was doing the same thing. I had 340. That was the best. Yeah, a lot I've more ever. weight. <laughs> well, I was 340, the third rep. I came up and that little zinger shot and it fell down and I tore it. And then um, didn't have surgery. So when I get on a heavy load, it's like this now for me. When I oh, get really? a real heavy load, you know, if I'm doing like a single or a double or triple. Yeah. Um, then the back injury, I was doing a charity show for, um, I don't know what's Because you got to be so careful how you say things nowadays. I, it was for uh, ladies and gentlemen with different kind of um, handicaps, like uh, Down syndrome or things of that nature. Sure. I was doing a charity show for a, a uh, therapeutic place like that. And so I had a horseshoe, which is my typical shoe that I twist. It's my challenge shoe. And depending on the audience, like if I'm doing a show for middle school kids, I won't bring my biggest, nastiest, you know, steel. If I was doing a show for you or Don the Dragon Wilson or, you know, because uh, I performed at the Arnold's two years in a row on the main mm-hmm. stage. So I'd bring a heavy one. Well, I didn't have a lighter, a lighter shoe. So I thought I'll just twist it anyway. I went to twist it and it wouldn't twist. So I made it twist anyway and my back popped. And I ended up getting, um, my chiropractor says one of the worst injuries you can have. I ended up tearing, I had a one, 1.1 centimeter tear 
in the nucleus of the disc, so like the lining of the disc at L4, L5, so the nucleus of the disc, sorry, leaked out onto my static nerve. So my left leg, I couldn't pick it up and I would drag it. I ended up having to use a walker and they wanted to do surgery. And I was against that because my chiropractor is one of my close friends. But when we had a phone call, he was actually choked up on the phone saying, Mike, I don't think I can help you. When he saw the MRI, he said, your injury is one of the worst you could possibly have. And I said, well, you always said, no, sir, what are we going to do? I don't, and I'm over here crying. You know, oh, yeah, I don't sure. Surgery, what do I do? And I was in so much pain. It's the worst pain I've ever experienced in my life. So uh, long story short, he got me on a conference call with him, a cancer doctor, and a surgeon from different states that are friends of his. And they said that the kind of injury that I have, there has been shown a 1%. That's it. One that people can beat this, beat this injury without surgery, but oftentimes, like I said, 1%, um, they can't do it because the first two months is so bad. But what happens after that is the nuclei, the white blood cells, I think I got that right, come and start eating up that debris around the injury and that, that tear will close. But that's an awfully big tear in that small area. So anyway, I didn't have surgery and then, uh, so that's why I don't deadlift anymore. That's why a lot of those kind of things I don't do anymore. Uh, but I feel fantastic. The leg, the leg is fine. Um, I see my chiropractor once a month. I've been on the mat. I can still roll. I can still do conditioning. There's just certain things I have no desire to do anymore. You know, because if I ever was to jack that up again, I'm, I'd be screwed. So. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I had a... Um a lower back injury as well. I think everybody at some point who lifts is going to run into that. And maybe me not to the uh, severity of yours, but when you say like some, something leaked out, did you feel that internally like leaking out? No, that's what they told me. What happened was the tear at the disc. There was a 1.1 centimeter tear. So then the nucleus of that disc leaked out and it was right near my fecal sac. I don't know all this medical thing. I'm, I think I'm pretty good, but if it, had, if it had been any closer to my fecal sac, I would have had to have emergency surgery because I wouldn't have been able to control, you know, body function of, you know. That, yeah, that's scary. I mean, the reason why I asked if you felt it internally leak is <laughs> we have a lot of the same injuries, man. <laughs> so <laughs> this goes back to high school. I think this time I was 16. So the year after I tore this, um, you know, I had 315 on the squat, no belt, nothing, wasn't even warmed up. I was just kind of showing off, and, you know, to one of my friends, basically. <laughs> but, um, you know, I did a couple of reps and then I felt my lower back like something bust open and it literally internally felt like some like fluid leaked out. And I was just like, oh, that's weird. But the funny thing is I, I was kind of OK. It wasn't like immediately I, I, I couldn't like stand or. I was bedridden. I seemed okay for the most part, but it did kind of, I, I, I pretty much tie that into my lower back injuries almost for the rest of my life. Where like, I was okay for a while in my twenties. And then when I got to 30, I, I had like a lot of lower back stiffness. Right. And then I remember anytime I would like even squat with anything over 200 pounds on my back, I couldn't even really walk the next day. And I'm like, Oh, that's not normal. You know, I did eventually get an MRI and you know, there's like, degenerative disc disorder in there yeah. you know the interesting thing uh it sounds like yours kind of healed itself right with the white blood cells eating all the debris and stuff well and the chiropractor i mean and I, the chiropractor he, okay he is what healed me because i couldn't walk i was bedridden i was mentally having flashbacks to my childhood because i was completely couldn't defend myself or, or protect my home and so it was a very trying time and i got to use a walker i thought that was a big deal yeah, where I live, in, it's a big county, and I live on a mountain. But a lot of people know me from doing strength shows for charity for schools and stuff. So when I got to go out in public with that walker, it just so happens, of course, at the grocery store, a lot of people knew me. Like, so that was a uh, humbling, weird experience. But hey, you yeah, because I mean? you were I'm Superman, there. and now you're walking around with kryptonite around your neck. Yeah, right? like the machine was not the machine, you know. So <laughs> yeah, the ah. Uh... Yeah, that's but, um, you move forward, right. You either it's all a mindset. You either you either tap out, submit, say, "Oh, poor me, poor me," or you like I said, you you look down between your legs, find your gusto, and you freaking move forward. You know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I am so anti-victim. I hate that. Like, poor me, poor me. It's like, dude, get just get that out of your system, yeah, and right. um, you know, you you can rebuild and 
you know, a lot of it's just attitude though, man, people get stuck in that. And I, and I do blame the mainstream media for brainwashing people, you know, making them want to victimizing, especially certain minority groups. It's like, dude, like, don't listen to that shit, man. Don't, don't get me started. <laughs> You'll get my mind going down rabbit holes. Don't get me started. Right <laughs> but real quick, Mike. So it's interesting. Um, yes, sir. you know, the, the lower back in injury, uh, flare up on and off, you know, I was actually bedridden for like an entire week before. And I just felt you know, basically like you did at one point, like you almost like question, am I ever going to be normal again? This is really pathetic and depressing, but I will say this. I searched for years trying to find a solution. And I finally found one. I was in a, in a jujitsu form and some guy had mentioned, you know, there's this routine that I use called the foundation. Um, and it's a series of like yoga inspired uh, static contraction exercises. And this is literally the only thing that helped my back. And I'm like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. I'll try anything, right? I don't want to get surgery or anything. But anyway, I did that routine. Uh, long story short, I completely vouch for it. I share it with everybody. This might help the audience, uh, which is why I'm sharing it with you, is essentially, I told you I went from not even being able to have 200 pounds on my back on a squat without like just being in excruciating pain, which is beyond pathetic. And I was able to, through that routine, able to build myself up where I could do a set of 12 with 315. So for me, that's great. For some people, they'll say, ah, 315 ain't shit on the squat. But trust me, when you can't even have 200 pounds on your back and do a couple reps and be screwed, the fact that you can have 315 and, and rep out, pretty goddamn good accomplishment in my book. So anyway, I, I highly agree. recommend that to anybody. And I always start my workout with, with part of that routine. I modified it, made it my own part of that routine, stretching, etc. Uh, and that's just helped a ton. So, but I don't deadlift. I don't deadlift. Like you said, you don't deadlift or do some of your crazy stuff. Cause I'm still paranoid about it. And, and I, I'll do squats once in a while. And then sometimes I don't do them for a while in my routine. And then sometimes I'll do them. So I'm not completely healed, but I can work around it luckily. And I give all credit to that, that book, that routine called the foundation. Yeah, I like you. I have my own certain program I do to keep my flexible and things like that that help my back. And, you know, regarding the weights, you said, like, some people might think, well, 315 is nothing for 15 reps. Well, here's the thing, you know. My deadlift, you know, I, I did it already. I'm, I'm happy, you know. I did a top-end deadlift with 695, which you've seen that video. I stepped yeah, out of the rack crazy, and now I stand up with it at 198 pounds. I've done reverse grip dips with 347 pounds on my waist. So I've done that already. I've already been there. So the people that want to talk trash, I've Zerker, Zerker squatted 500, which is a video. I've that. seen that. That's ridiculous. I told well, my wife about that real quick, Mike. I'm just like, how's it? Oh, or your partial rack deadlift, I think, with how much was it? 1,500 pounds or something? 1,500. But let me just say this real quick before I get off, because I'll forget. And it's sure, important sure. that people need to understand is when you, as you get older, people, first of all, people don't care what you've done anyway. Only a small smidgen of people will care, but. I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to be that guy anymore because I've already done it. It's video. It's always going to be there, right? But I'm not done. So guys like yourself and I, myself, that have had injuries, we've come back. doesn't mean we're done. We're not tapping out. We're just going to be the best at something else that we can do. Mm -hmm. Like myself, I started doing my, my push-ups again, like I said, the past year and a half now. And, and I'm going to still be the best I can. I'm just not doing certain things that I used to do. And I don't have to. That's okay. Because the people that want to talk trash probably haven't even done it anyway, and no one can. So that's what I wanted to say, you know? Yeah. Things do change yeah. And re -age. There's basically always something you can improve on. Like, if, if you're not improving on a max bench, well, maybe you improve on, on reps and endurance. Like, there's always something to work towards, you know, and get better at. But going back to some of your ridiculous stuff, like that rack pull, I was telling my wife the other day, I'm just like, how does this dude's, like, you know, shoulders just not rip out of their sockets? Because 1,500 pounds is ridiculous just holding it right without having your shoulders rip out of your sockets <laughs> that was um that was done in two, 2007 may 16th 2007 in lakeland florida at bud jeffries the guy i talked to about earlier strongman performer at his house oh, and uh, i was 202 pounds and that rack pool started making a comeback a couple years pre pre this virus crap and a lot of guys uh you know, people always say, oh, that's a crap lift or whatever, you know, but uh, that when I did it, that actually ended up in uh, Muscle Mag International twice. Mm. I have the articles uh, not here. They're in my, this is my strength dojo, but they're in my, my business gym. 
and then ended up in a, uh, there was a bodybuilder named Jeff Everson or Everson that had planet muscle ended up in there too. And, um, I, the only reason I even started doing that stuff, people say it's an eagle. Lift. I did it because I was weak at the top of my deadlift. I was decent on the pickup. I was really strong from the knees up. I mean, from chin to knee, but when I got here, where I got stuck. So I figured if I could set the bar at that position and handle more weight than what I would handle from the floor, it's going to help me. And it did. And that just turned into something more and more. And then I started doing that in my strength shows. I had a bar made and I had uh, seats made for it, like a swing. And I have four people in the audience. I had center blocks and I picked them up. And I have video of that as well. So the, I'm, I'm going on a bit again. But the 1500, yes, it was very, I've never felt that kind of feeling before on my body. Because even though I locked it out and I was completely straight, that is so heavy that it's like my shoulders felt like they were going to, I was never felt the kind of impact on my whole entire system, if that makes any sense. It just, I can't put it into words. It was very, very different. <laughs> That's why I had to talk about it to my wife. Because anybody who lifts, they understand weights. Like if, if somebody's never been in the gym, 1,500 pounds would still sound ridiculous, but they don't know what like 400 pounds feels like, right? Or three or five, like they just don't get it. So the fact that 1,500 pounds, again, just like when I'm trying to think of your one arm row with 315, it's like, it's, it's just crazy because I know what weights feel like. And like I said, I'm not the strongest guy, but I'm kind of strong. But you're, you're, yeah. the weights you're throwing around are just like beyond ridiculous, man. And it's not well, like you're twice that. my size. You're like 200 pounds. You know, I'm like 180. So it's not like you're this 400 pound dude. No, I'm a little, little taller than you. But I mean, I, and I appreciate your, your kind words. Like I've always said, you know, I don't, I'm nobody's role model. You know, I got a moral compass. Try to have a code. I follow a bunch of dings in it, a bunch of, you know, smashes here and there. But uh, if anything I've ever done ever, again, I'm not a role model, but if anybody gets motivated from anything I've done, then that, hey, that's really cool too, you know. I'm, I, I, I think the things that you've done, knowing that, you know, you're not the mountain from Game of Thrones, but you're like a 200-pound dude, you're lifetime natural, and just like thinking, or not even thinking, but watching your videos, because there's actually proof, and yes. you do these lifts, it just kind of shatters what most people think is even possible. And that's a good thing. It's like when the dude broke that four minute mile, nobody thought it could be done. Then all of a sudden everybody's, well, not everybody, but a lot of people are doing it because they believe it. So things that you do, like these strength feats, I think it is important, you know, for people to see that because then it's like, it breaks those barriers. It's just like, don't put a limit on yourself because like, look, look at the crazy ass stuff this guy's doing. I just, I'm very much into you know, practicing what I preach and not pretending to be something and or do something, be someone I'm not and or do something I've never done. There's too much of that kind of trash. And I am, I am not a, uh, a poser. I don't need a pack with me. I'm strictly a lone, you know, kind of sounds funny, lone wolf. I don't need no pack. Not a, I'm not a badass. I train, train to be a badass, but I'm not. I, um, I just believe 100%. If I tell you I've done something, I've done it, and I have video to back it up. And I just think that's really lacking in today's society where everybody wants to play make-believe, pretend to be something they're not, or they pretend they did this and they didn't, or they're in mama's house, in mama's basement, talking a bunch of smack about everybody. And it's like, I would rather just do my thing. And if I think it's impressive enough or I'm really proud of it, I'll put a video of it. And if that motivates somebody, cool. But basically, it's just a training diary for me. You know, if somebody wants to talk to me like yourself, I'm real picky with who I'll talk to and I haven't really done a lot of shows and a lot. I mean, been on shows in a, quite a while, um, like your like your show, just because I don't not big on social media. And I find most of society a bunch of knuckleheads. But when you have a kind, good person like yourself, and there is good people, then I'm more than happy to uh, share and talk. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, I would consider yourself a badass. I mean, you're you're humble, so I could see why you're not necessarily going to call yourself one. Just like I don't no. think most people should call themselves one. But no. other people should, you know, like if it's justified, right? Like that, that's the thing about, um, you know, some people will talk themselves up, but it's like, it doesn't work, man. Other people have to talk about you and then it's real, right? You know, yeah. <laughs> anyway. So anyway, I'm, I'm calling you a badass. You know, take I, it for money. Uh, <laughs> well, again, who really even cares? Like, is that something proud of? I'm a bad, I'm a badass. I mean, where my ass on my sleeve, like, who cares? You know what I mean? I think as, a, as, as a guy, and I know you do a lot of real man blog videos, it's pretty yeah. cool if another guy calls you a badass, trust me. I mean, you may oh, not care, is, but, is, but just take it as a compliment, man, because if somebody called me a badass, 
uh, you know, with my martial arts or whatever. It's like, okay, cool. I'm not going to call myself one. But if somebody <laughs> called me one, it's like, I'll take it. So just, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. I think that's, I think that's good. I just, uh, like I said, I just, I'm just Mike, you know what I mean? Sure, I, sure. I mean, yeah, I got the nickname, the machine and it's, you know, it's well, it's well warranted. I, I imagine, but it's, uh, you know, I've been that name for 13, 14 years now, but, um, but just because I do something doesn't mean somebody else is going to find it that person too. So I think it's, people get lost and you start to have success and you stop being hungry. You can let your attitude get out of control and you start to really think that you're all that. It's like, what does that do really? Like I said, you got a small group of people, a circle that might actually care about that. But for the most part, people don't. Because when all the smoke is cleared and everyone's through chanting your name, it's just going to be us. I think it's, that's like, I, when, if you look at boxing or MMA, you know, I tend to lean on the guys, like a guy like Fedor, who is quiet, doesn't talk. Even now at his age, he's a little younger than me, can still smash you, but yet he's not going to be like uh, Floyd Mayweather or Adrian Brown or some guy that, or McGregor that runs their mouths and talks and talks and talks. And, and of course, those guys can back it up. I, I just lean towards the guy that's more quiet, just looks at you, and then he gets in there and destroys you. I kind of like that. No, yeah, better, no, that, uh, that's definitely. But that's just my, sure. my, uh, my choice. Yeah. You know? Hey, speaking of which, uh, though, how did you get that nickname, The Machine? So the nickname The Machine was given to me by Dennis Rogers and Bud Jeffries, uh, 2006 or five. I had sent video to Bud Jeffries of my strength, and he said, man, that for a guy as light as you, you're really, really strong. Because, again, I'm always between 195 and 210. I feel best where I am right now, 195, 198. And so uh, when I started learning, because doing feats of strength is one thing. You can be strong, but if you don't know how to speak and captivate the audience, you can put a big, huge, strapping guy next to me. He could be strong with me, but I guarantee you, if he can't talk, I'm going to run him off the stage. Mm -hmm. You have to have some charisma when you talk, mm -hmm. personality, and mine's just based off of me. It's based off my childhood. It's not fake. The machine is just me with the volume turned up. And the reason they gave me the name is because they said that I was really strong, but I was also in great condition being a wrestler. I just always trained so I could do conditioning type things and, you know, get on the mat as well as be as strong. And typically you see one or the other. Usually you'll see a guy that's big and really powerful or, or but not fast or mobile, tactical, or you'll see a little fella that, Speed got a little wasp waist, but it's pretty half and all that kind of trash, which is cool. Nothing against the pretty wasp guys, but and, but they're not really strong. So like I could do a human flag from a pole, but most of the guys that do that are you know one one sixty, you know smaller fellas. Then you got the the rarity guys that are really big fellas. I think there's a big dude. Uh, dude I don't like that word of dude, but uh, the Marine Corps they call us dudes and make fun of us. But anyway, uh, there's some strong man. Not, I mean, not a strong man. What's that guy's name? He's a big, big guy, like 300 pounds. He does a human flag. Jeez. So that's just a, a rarity, of course. Can't yeah, no, name. that's that's cool, man. But yeah, you got all the like the real functional stuff that you could use. And, you know, like you said, you may need to use that someday, right? With the way the world is. <laughs> no, hopefully not. I try to only yeah, go well early not. in yeah. the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I only go to the store because like real early in the morning because I'm up early at like 4.30 anyway. Or I go late at night when no one's around. So I just gotta stay, gotta stay away from those situations. Yeah. Hey, let, let me ask you this. So obviously hard work, consistency, training correctly, even the technique with you know bending horseshoes, etc., all that comes into play. But at, at the core, you gotta have like some kind of natural talent. Like there, there's you know, you take a you take another guy your size, he's not gonna be able to even get close to your strength levels. You have to like be naturally gifted and then you work on the technique you work on the training you work on everything just like you know uh olympic sprinter for example the gold medalist that is not a thing that the vast majority of people would ever do even get close to that level no i'm not saying he didn't work his ass off but he was born sure. to with those gifts so i'm thinking Maybe. someone like you and that guy have gifts. i don't know i don't know i don't no. know because it's different it's when you learn to bend steel, it's just like when you lift weights. There's progression. So anybody can train to do it. I don't believe the, nat the natural ability comes in per se. Mm. Not necessarily because I can say, okay, Anthony, I'm going to train you. I'm going to give you a bunch of railroad spikes, and I'm going to show you how to do this, and I want you to bend 10 of these 
every day. And let's see, we get, oh, if you can't, we'll get you something you can bend. You bend 10 bends or 20 bends every day. And then when you can do it easy, we're going to go up to the next grade of steel. So it's progressive resistance, just like lifting. So I don't know if you're necessarily talented. That, that depends. I was always told that I was very talented strength because I was strong. That's where the machine came, came come in. I was strong all across the board. I didn't have this one thing. You, you, you understand? So like some guys had, like that Chris Shrek guy, was super strong in doing this and then bending long still. And uh, Robert's good at bending this. And then you, so I was just kind of, and I'm, and I'm not saying I'm better. I'm, I just was strong everywhere. Okay. And I, and I excelled at the next stuff. And, you know, so I, you know, I got my neck hard and all that trash. And so I think natural ability comes into when you, when you can actually get on stage and speak from a thousand people like I have mm -hmm. and be able to hold their, hold their, um, hold their attention for that amount of time. Then I think a natural part comes in. I don't know if that okay, makes sense. I was thinking like maybe when you were younger or first started lifting or even wrestling in high school, you were just like naturally stronger than like all these other kids about your size and your age. No, I wasn't. I was just really? a very, very hard worker. No, I didn't. Well, I never I discount the hard work, but that's interesting if I, cause I just assumed, okay, this guy has a natural gift and then he just worked his ass off to build on no, top of I that. Had a natural, were like, I had a natural drive because of my childhood. Okay. I was not strong as a kid. I was malnourished. I was skinny. I was getting my tail kicked all the time. Not just I didn't know anything. I just didn't have the confidence. I didn't have the mentality because all I thought I was was a piece of crap punk. I was going to be a punk, a piece of crap, never going to amount to anything for my biological father and my mom's second husband. That's all I thought. Of. That's all I knew. So I got on the mat I did not have a way to flip the switch to take the aggression to fight back. I was just a rag doll. I was nothing. So then to answer the question, the second part, because I, I had to, you know, have a little debate. I said I would debate, but I debated with you in a nice way, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, you. sure. Yeah, right. So um, the second part, you said, when did I realize? I realized I was more strong, uh, stronger than most in my weight class when I was about 17. So uh, junior year, that's when I realized. And I realized that a lot of strength tests that most had trouble with, I did not, such as push-ups and pull-ups and all that. And then when I learned to flip my switch and be able to then say, okay, look, I'm not this punk piece of crap kid. I'm going to become something. I'm just going to work every day. That's why I said, really, yeah, I, I did well in grappling back in the 90s. Yes, I, I was – Undefeated in New England for two years. I've got newspaper articles about that. I, all that is true. But again, as I said, I was not the most technical. I worked my ass off, trained all the time, and I found that, okay, I'm not the most skilled I'm never going to be. I'm just an aggressive forward guy in the mat, on the mat. But I am in great shape, and I love to work out. So I'm going to use that to my advantage and base my fighting or wrestling style off of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But, it, but so I guess it does seem like once you had your confidence and there were some natural things like you could out push up, out pull up the average kid. So, yes. you know, there was something there, like even me, like I literally had the, um, like the record in my uh, middle school for push ups and pull ups, 120 push ups, 28 pull ups. So just, you know, I never got near the strength levels you did in adulthood, but I had like a natural, you know, athletic uh, ability compared to a lot of the other kids. Well, I guess all the kids in that school, actually. So yeah, that's why you, I was kind of thinking that. I just found that I just learned at a young age that the more you train and the more you go forward and the more you keep doing something over and over repetitive, that you get better at it. And it's just the same as uh, the same as doing feats of strength. You know, I, I can st I'm looking over that way. That's what my steel is. If I grab something, I, I can bend something. Even though I haven't touched it in a while, I can bend it. But the more I do it, the stronger I'm going to get. It's just sure. the more you do something. Like, I'm not on the mat all the time because at my gym, the people that I'm training, they, they can't stretch me. But when I went back to Massachusetts to, to visit family, I saw my old coach, and I hadn't been on the mat with anybody that can whoop me, for, you know, per se, in a long time. And all of his students, he's got a very successful competitive school, were like, we want to see coach go against the machine. And I'm like, oh, for goodness sakes, you know, so – I'm like, okay. So I get on the mat and it was, um, and he's like, man, you've not lost anything. You at all. you even feel stronger to me. And so what I'm, what I'm meaning is that, so on the mat, my timing might not be where it is. My speed might not be where it is. 
and my my uh, technique as far as doing certain things I'm good at might not be where it is, but if I go on the mat every day, that's all going to come back up. Yeah. So I think if anything in life, if you do something over and over repetitively, and you never forget to learn, always learn, learn, learn. You're only, you you can only get better unless you're a complete freaking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, you, you know? <laughs> can you do this, Mike? This has always impressed me. Like those, I don't even know if you've tried, but those dudes who like will rip a phone book in half or like a deck of cards. Have you ever tried any yes. of those? Yes, I can rip a deck of cards. I Here's the problem with the phone book for me. That's, that's, you had to bring that up. I was, this conversation was going well. That's my kryptonite because I won't oh, The do phone it. book kryptonite. Well, lucky for you, oh, they don't I even make do those it. anymore. I'm sorry? They don't even make those anymore. So no one needs well, to know, talk about phone books. I won't do a phone book. Here's the thing. There is a technique to it. Not the tricksters out there, they're going to go pop the binding. That's cheating. That's fake. And that's why I don't do it. The legit way of doing it, you're le- legitimately ripping the phone book. Yeah. But that is a – here's the difference. If you took me and I'm going to rip a phone book legit, you take some other guy and he's going to pop the binding and rip it. To the crowd, no one's going to tell the difference. So they're going to look at it like, well, they both ripped the phone book. Sure. So I could give – your wife, I don't know anything about your wife, I've never seen her. I, let's say she's a real fit lady like yourself, but she's a little tiny girl, you know, 100 pounds, let's say. I could give her a phone book and me a phone book. I could tell her how to cheat it. And to the crowd, it's going to look like, wow, she's stronger than him. Look what she did. It's, gonna, it's, just, a, it's just a feat that I am, um, this is not my thing, but some other fellas that are strong in performance have taken that to a whole level. Like they duct tape it and stuff. These guys that are really strong. That, um, so that, that way it takes the whole thing. It takes whoever's cheating it out of the equation. You know? mm. Going to that deck it. of cards, by the way, that's, that's got to be a cool bar trick. I, I, you got to teach me how to do that sometime. But so. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one. Because it is pretty you – have, you have um, cheaper cards, of course, and you've got really good decks of cards, just like anything. But uh, that's, that's a good one to do. So basically, I'm I'm assuming the progression you would maybe start with like what twenty cards and then maybe exactly. twenty-five and exactly yep mm. and there's a certain way to do it you know the way they Dennis Rogers teaches that you hold it in your hand like this you grab your hand like this and you tear it this way I never got the hang of that so I hold it by the deck vertical like this and I twist it across and rip it. Would you say that's harder than the horseshoe bend or is a horseshoe? I know there's different levels of horseshoes, but. Um, I'm, I would say for me, the deck of cards is harder only because I'm, I'm horseshoes is more my kind of thing. I, I'm not the best at that, but I, I could probably, I think I'm up there with some of the real top players that I, I could pull quite a good shoe open because cool. I got a lot. Of, that's where my last strength is one of my better things in my grip. So I think, um, the cards is just the thumb comes into play. This thumb is broken twice across the knuckles. So it doesn't bend all the way. So for me, that, that's my excuse. <laughs> I'm just better at horseshoes than I am cards. But you don't, you don't do the horseshoes anymore, right? Because of the back? Oh, no. I you can still, still do, do them. That's one of the first thing I wanted to do when I got healthy again after the injury was I wanted to twist that same shoe. And I can still do that, yes. Oh, interesting. That's cool. I'll do one for you on video, not here, but I'll do one for video for Christmas. I'll mail it to you. Okay. I'll do a YouTube video. Yeah, I want to see you do, do cards too. I can do both. I'll go, Mr. Samurai, so for you, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do that before Christmas. I'll do a video and then I'll, I'll mail it to you. I, I got to work on that card thing, man. Can you imagine like if you did that in a bar? Like people would be I did. I did it at a restaurant. Oh, did you? I did it. There's a, there's a, a stick. I, I think it's a chain. I don't know if it's elsewhere where it is, but in Kentucky, it's called Malone Steakhouse. So myself, my family, we were there. And just, it was so cool because there was a whole bunch of people. And I don't talk. Like, uh, the in-law family are not my people. So I'm very quiet. But it just happened to be all the in-laws were there. And I'm sitting there. And these two uh, guys come off the back and they're, excuse me, sir, are you Mike the Machine? And I was like, Lord, this is the day. Yes, I am. I, yes, I am Mike the Machine, gosh damn it. What can I do for you? Man, they, they made out all over me like, man, you're the neck guy. <laughs> Can you do something for us to roll a frying pan? I said, well, yeah, I don't got a frying pan. They come out with a cast iron skillet. I'm like, I can't roll a freaking cast iron skillet. What are you, out of your mind? So I actually went to the gas station, got a deck of cards, and they only had really hard decks. I, I know what decks are easy and what decks are hard. Because, again, if I'm doing a show for kids, I don't got to do a max effort because kids aren't going to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they're not going to know anyway. And I've done shows in max security prison, so I want to bring hard, nasty stuff. So I always let someone try to do what I'm doing. I wasn't biting them up on stage. So anyway, 
I got this massive deck of cards in the Malone Steakhouse. They had me tear this deck of cards in front of the whole entire freaking restaurant, and I did it. And my in-laws are looking at me like, wow, this guy, you know, it's always, and then they gave me a menu, and the thing with Malone's is anyone that is, I guess, somebody, they make you sign, have to sign a menu. So they signed, I signed a Malone's menu and took a picture and put my menu on the wall of the restaurant. So That's cool, man. That's yeah, it couldn't happen at a better time. That was the time I'm like, yes, I am the machine. I'm freaking strong. What do you want me to do? <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. I'll say this. like, Wouldn't that be the perfect way to uh, exit a card game? Like if you just lost, you just like rip the cards and, and leave. <laughs> and don't even say anything. Just your, leave. <laughs> that could be your stick. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty cool, man. 